3,000 years ago, tin was mined in Britain and plated onto bronze by Greek smiths to make the bright armor of Homeric heroes. But Britain itself had no tin plate industry until 300 years ago, when an English soldier brought the secret of its manufacture back from Central Europe to an ironworks on the border of Wales. 1856, with the coming of steel, came also the modern manufacture of tin plate. In dozens of factories, South Wales began to make tin plate for the world. For nearly a hundred years, tin plate has been made like this in scores of mills in Wales. Hot from the furnace, the steel bars are rolled, and caught, and rolled, and caught, four passes in all, and returned to the furnace. Packed in the furnace, they come out to be rolled again, until doubles become fours, and fours eights and many thin sheets of steel are being rolled together. Skilled work, fine work, but slow and costly. Because after all this rolling, finishing processes are many and complicated. Five rolling mills, each with three teams of six men, must be backed up by 250 other workers, 200 men and 50 girls, to produce 336,000 sheets, or 6,000 boxes of tin-plated steel a week. Since 1938, this mill at Ebu Vale has been rolling out steel for tin plating as a continuous strip. Because the strip is continuous throughout, instead of being separate plates, the whole job can be carried out more quickly, more accurately and more cheaply. And without the sweat and labour needed in the old type pack mills. Ebu Vale proved that new methods of making tin plate must, in the end, replace the old. During the war years, a site was chosen for a vast new works, which would complete the modernization of the South Wales tin plate industry and make it the best integrated production centre in the world. In the drawing offices, plans were prepared. Here on a map of South Wales is the existing strip mill at Ebu Vale. Here around Swansea and Llanethi are most of the old pack mills. And here are the Port Talbot and Margam Iron and Steelworks. The plan was to modernise and extend the Margam Iron and Steelworks, raising the capacity of the blast furnaces to approximately one million tonnes of pig iron per year. to build alongside it on the Margam Moors a completely new hot strip mill to produce about one million tonnes per year of hot strip. To roll about 7,000 tonnes a week of strip into sheets in a new coal mill on the same site. And to send 7,000 tonnes of strip a week to a new coal mill and tin plate works to be built near Llanelli, a few miles away. This was the first phase. Later on, the capacity of the Margam plant could be stepped up to feed another coal tin plate plant, like the one at Trostre. But the key to it all was this, that from the sea, iron ore should come in, and at the other end of the production line, finished steel should go out. Between a ruined grange of the old Margam Abbey and the Margam works in the distance, the Abbey hot strip mill was to stand. In the spring of 1947, clearance of the site began. The inhabitants were still hanging on, watching, as the advanced parties moved in. This lake was one of two which had to be drained as quickly as possible. It was a sticky job, surveying and marking out the site. 
First priority was the building of temporary access roads and the digging of temporary open drains to clear the waterlogged ground. Closed culverts had to be constructed too. Permanent drainage for the hill water crossing the site of the sea. And trouble was struck early. Here mud invaded work already done and had to be shoveled out by hand and bucket before the concreting of the culvert could begin. In the open drains, pipe culverts had to be built to carry the water under the sites of future roads and railway embankments. Reconstruction of Margam Steelworks was an integral part of the scheme. Two blast furnaces were to be rebuilt. Coke ovens, harbour space, or transporter equipment were all to be extended. In August, number two blast furnace began to be dismantled. Below, the old pig bed was being cleared, ready for new rail tracks into the new furnaces. This stack had to make way for the new coke ovens. There wasn't much room in which to drop it, and the extent to which the brickwork arch would pull it to one side was difficult to calculate. But it came down safely, with the loss of only one hut and two bicycles. In a few weeks, blast furnace number two was down almost to ground level. On October the 24th, the last metal work was being cut away. Trostre near Llanelli is the third main part of the scheme, site of a cold rolling mill and template works which will deal with a large part of the output from the hot strip mill at Abbey. Trostre is on farmland, like Abbey, low-lying by the sea. And here, too, the first job was to make usable access roads. And here, too, drainage was the first necessity on the site itself. A permanent open drain was dug around the whole works, with culverts and pipe drains where roads and railways must cross. This is a cattle crossing, for farmland will march right up to the works. Inside the perimeter drain, by early October, an ash carpet brought from the old tips of various works for miles around was already filling and levelling the site. The Abbey site again in August 1947. The first railway siding was coming off the GWR track. Work on the culverts had to be speeded up. Your shuttering is being lowered into place ready for the concrete. Because across the culverts, the temporary railway track was due to run. Once the culvert had been fully concreted, it was covered in with sand. The lake had already been drained. But before the ground could be used to bear any load, tons of silt had to be cleared off it by grab. The silt was not wasted, but taken to the sand hills to provide soil for trees, which would be planted to keep the sand from shifting. The ground cleared, ditches dug, culverts completed. Now the filling of the site began in earnest. A sandwich made up of three or four million tons of sand and slag will fill in and level up the site. The top of this survey point will eventually be ground level. Slag was available in great quantities from the Morva Bank tip of the Margam Steelworks. Part of Morva Bank had in any case to be cleared to make way for the central repair shop. The slag proved too tough a proposition for mechanical diggers, and a way of loosening it up had to be found. 100 foot long galleries were driven into the bank and filled with explosives.
sand for the other layer of the sandwich was also available in unlimited quantities, particularly from one great dune known as the whaleback. Lima diggers lifting five tons of sand at a time drop the sand neatly, or fairly neatly, into 15-ton Euclid trailers. The Euclids could haul these 15-ton loads rapidly across the site and open their bomb doors and drop the sand and get away in one action. By autumn, the north end of the site was looking like this. Down through the filling and deep into Margam Moors, over 33,000 concrete piles now had to be driven. As another means of filling sand, a dredger was assembled in a specially dug lagoon, which was later to be the water reservoir. A pipeline was laid towards specially bunded areas, which means areas surrounded with clay banks to contain water. The dredger sucked up water and sand and pumped the mixture along the pipeline to the bunded areas, where the water dropped the sand and was pumped back to the lagoon, leaving 400 tons of sand in position every hour. A pipeline system on a smaller scale was also used for delivering concrete to foundation work, wherever a fairly continuous flow was needed. By winter 1947, Foundation work of some of the shops was already well underway. These are the soaking pits on February the 17th, 1948. The first steel work arrives on the site. First priority was given to the erection of the mold yard shop with all welded girders. When completed, this mold yard was to be used as a temporary factory for prefabricating other heavy steelwork, too large to be brought to the site by rail or road. Almost simultaneously with the first steelwork on the site, the steelwork for the bridge designed to carry the main access road across the railway was being swung into place. In this first year, the site changed completely. This view was taken in May 1947. This is the same area on March the 1st, 1948. This again was taken that first May. The following March, the Furnace Bay was taking shape. May 1947, March 1948. All over the site throughout 1948, recognizable shapes were built up out of the confusion. What in the summer was still a muddy hole in the ground, surrounded by scaffolding, emerged towards the end of the year as the coal washery. The pump house, which in the spring of 1948 was another hole in the ground, only this time a very large hole needing tall concrete sides, by late summer was a complicated job half finished. and in April 1949 was really beginning to look like a pump house. By September 1948, the outfall culvert, which was to carry away surplus water from the site, was halfway through the sand dunes which separate the site from the sea. To build this culvert, special shuttering was used capable of being moved along as each section of concreting was finished. In 
May 1948, the soaking pits were still at foundation stage. But by January 1949, their chimneys were already going up beside them. In May 1948, the new blast furnace was just beginning to grow from the cleared site of the old furnace. To carry the vast weight of iron ore and coke and limestone to be melted on its 25 foot 9 inch hearth, the concrete base must be more heavily reinforced than anything else in the whole project. By February 1949, the base was complete. And in April, the furnace was going up fast. The plan was taking shape indeed. Late in the summer, the mole yard began its job as a factory for prefabricating steel girders. Inside, giant manipulators were assembled. While outside, a Goliath crane was set up to handle the girders as they were completed. These rings will contain the girders and turn them over for easy working. In November, the Goliath crane is nearly finished. And the first girder is hauled out of the mold yard. Symbolic of the speed at which the landscape changed was the work on the cooling tower. This was its base at the end of August. And this was how far work had progressed by January 1949. March, nearly finished. Four months ahead of schedule. Let's go up it. On top work men, most of whom had no previous training for work at heights, but whose confidence grew with the tower itself. All the concrete on which they've been raised sky high came out of one small concrete mixer. Below them, the great works takes on its ultimate appearance. The pump house. The rolling mill, still a long way to go here. The washery conveyor in the distance. The central repair shop. The Goliath making the furnace bay. The mole yard, an ingot stripper bay beyond. The plan takes shape. Over a truss tray, the last recognizable feature of the old farm had disappeared in August. Culverts and drains were being completed. This one is being laid on a special raft to prevent it sinking into the ground. And throughout the year, piling of the site went on. Pile tops are tidied up and made level, ready for the concrete raft which will bind them together. In July, work was starting on the mill foundation, and the site looked like this. In April 1949, Trostre 2 was beginning to take shape. In the autumn, machinery for the rolling mills at Margam and Trostre had begun to arrive from the United States. This mill housing for the coal mill at Trostre weighed 97 tons. The floating crane was only supposed to lift 100 tons, 
which didn't leave much of a margin. From then on, there were regular arrivals at Port Talbot for Margam and Swansea for Trostre. And all through 1949, the pile of machinery kept growing. October the 11th, 1949. While the last piles were still being driven into the site at Abbey, the plan of the bays and shops had taken shape. The central repair shop was up. The cooling tower, pump house and water tower were nearly finished. The stanchions of the melting shop were moving south. The conveyors strode across the site. The coke ovens were lengthening. A year later, in the autumn of 1950, at first sight, the shape had not greatly altered. The melting shop is up. The main shop, to contain the strip mill itself, has reached its limit. The shape stands. Now, behind the shape achieved by the civil and constructional engineers, throughout 1950, it is the mechanical engineers who have been making the changes. Here is the tippler for home iron ore and for limestone, and beside it, at the end of the sidings, the coal tipplers. If we follow these raw materials along the conveyors that will carry them to where they are needed, it will, for the first time, be easy to see how the layout of the whole development scheme has been planned. From the coal tipplers, coal goes up to a new washery. From the washery, the washed coal goes across to new coke ovens, which will increase the total output of coke to 15,000 tonnes per week. The coke is still going on by rail, but the new conveyor will carry it up to a screening plant and then on again towards the Margam blast furnaces. Halfway along this stretch, the coke conveyor is joined by the ore and limestone conveyor. Along this conveyor, up to 400 tonnes an hour of home-produced ore and limestone can be brought, all for the Margam blast furnaces. Here, at the last bend, where the conveyors divide again, ore and limestone go up into hoppers, and the coke conveyor straight through on the level to the bunkers beyond. All this speed-up in the flow of raw materials is to supply new and larger blast furnaces. In October 1949, the new number two blast furnace was already taking shape. Number one had been rebuilt three years before. Nine months later, in the summer of 1950, number two furnace was being fitted with its water cooling system. The half of this new furnace is 25 foot nine inches across. The hot blast manifold was in place. The bells, which prevent gas from escaping when the burden of raw materials is loaded through the top, had been fitted, and the superstructure was getting a coat of paint. The conveyors will be ready to bring the raw materials from which the blast furnace will produce molten iron. But iron ore from overseas will also be needed. 
the first of three new unloaders and transporters for dealing with seaborne cargoes of iron ore is being built. It too was ready by the autumn of 1950. And below it, the wharf had been extended to take bigger ships. The ore will be there for the new furnace. While the system of conveyors and hoppers is being completed, the flow of raw materials to the existing number one and number three furnaces must not be broken. But in the autumn, the old hoist, which for years brought them up by the wagon load, gives way to the conveyors for the coke and transfer cars for the ore and limestone. The raw materials are there to feed the new furnace. The burden is in. The cars keep moving. The blast is turned on. The raw materials keep coming. November the 9th, 1950, number two blast furnace is in operation. So the metal begins to flow from the latest and largest blast furnace in Britain. Much of the iron from the new furnace is planned to go back along the railway tracks from Margham to the new melting shop at the Abbey Works for conversion into steel. Below here will be the mixers into which the hot metal from Margham will be poured. The metal from the mixer will be transferred by 75 tonne ladles into eight 200-ton steel furnaces, four of which can be seen here. In the summer of 1950, bricking of the first few furnaces was well on the way. Beyond the furnaces are the bays for handling the other raw materials, such as scrap, which will be melted together with the iron into steel. Up this ramp, train loads of scrap will come. And already the stocks of scrap are being laid in. But until the Abbey melting shop was ready, the melting shop at Margham could supply steel ingots for the Abbey mill. Here is a train of ingots passing the washery. Travelling back the way the conveyors came, alongside and across the road from Margham to Abbey. This is a 90-ton diesel electric locomotive shunting the train. Now the ingots near the ingot stripping bay, the first stage in that three-quarter of a mile journey, which in the end will convert 20-ton steel ingots into 600 yards of strip, a tenth of an inch thick.
but unlike the scrap for the melting shop, these ingots are not simply being stocked until the mills are ready. They are being taken to the soaking pits for reheating. This is the second great change that has taken place in 1950. Part of the Abbey rolling mills is ready for work. The slabbing mill can begin to earn its keep. This is what has been happening. By the autumn of 1950, the soaking pits were almost ready. The last bricks were going in. There are 20 of these pits capable of handling 25,000 tons of ingots a week. Below the pits, the last of the flues for the 20 furnaces were being completed. All down the line of the mills themselves, throughout 1950, machinery was coming in. Onto specially prepared bolts, ready mounted in the foundations, every piece of machinery must be lowered exactly. The position of each of these boats must be right to within a sixteenth of an inch in any direction. When the whole sixty or seventy ton casting is in place, it must not be possible to slide a playing card between it and the foundations at any of the support points. The greatest urgency was to finish the slabbing mill itself, for the slabbing mill could start the useful job of rolling ingots into slabs without waiting for the rest of the mills to be ready. This is the entry table, where the ingots will be carried into the slabbing mill. Here is some of the gearing being assembled. This is the crop conveyor, which will recover the metal trimmed from the slabs. And here is the motor room capable of taking a load of 4,000 to 5,000 amperes at 600 volts every time the slabbing mill reverses. All over the site, the work is keeping pace. Power is ready. Water. pump house, the gas mains for the soaking pits, cranes to handle the great loads. Every one of these cranes has been designed so that even at the most awkward places a man may stand in safety. And the cold mills, which later will take the hot strip and cold roll it into sheets and tin plate, are pushing ahead. This is the cold sheet mill at Abbey, and this the cold tin plate mill at Trostre in December 1949. <laughs> By the autumn of 1950, the five-stand mill, round which the whole work revolves, was in place. The palm oil tanks were being completed. The coal mill at Abbey and the coal mill at Trostre would not be needed till after the autumn of 1951, when the hot rolling mills would be running in. But ready they must be as the hot strip begins to come. And now at Abbey, the soaking pits have heated the ingots to 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. The controls in the slabbing mill pulpit have been tested. The ingots are on their way.
buggy car is waiting to take the ingot up to the mill. Ingot is weighed and turned round, ready for the entry table. When this mill has been fully run in, it'll be capable of slabbing 350 tons an hour. The start of the slabbing mill is the chief symbol of the great change that has taken place in 1950. The development scheme has been translated from drawing board to architectural shape, and from architectural shape to working machinery inside it. The project is beginning to pay its way. So to Port Talbot in South Wales has come a development which will affect all the unnamed people living in these houses for a generation and more. If it had not been for iron and steel, there would have been no Port Talbot. Now its future would be linked with the most up-to-date steel plant of its kind in the world. All down the line from the slabbing mill, at the end of 1950, the new machines were growing. Beyond the roughing mill, the six-stand finishing mill. 46,000 horsepower is needed to drive this strip mill. 
as much power as it takes to drive a good-sized ocean liner. January 1951. The last machinery is in place in the last few yards of a three-quarter of a mile run. The rollers are still. The motors silent and covered with grease. But for four years, the work of construction has never been still. And now, as everywhere, the construction is being completed. The movements of the builders give place to a new movement. The whole works is coming into production. 